the seed of word moment for today is John 8, 31 through 32. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If you notice here, Jesus said to the Jews who believed on him. These Jews had decided, you know what? What Jesus is preaching is true. We believe it. We're going to live by it. But then he's told them something very important. He says, if you continue in my word, then you are actually following me. Then are you my disciples. Then are you my sons and daughters indeed. And he says, if you continue, then you will know the truth. And the truth will make you free. If you go on to the next scripture verse, it says, They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? They said, Lord, Jesus, we've never been in bondage to anyone. We have no issues. We can tell that these people did not really have an understanding of their own nature, of the, the wicked nature. Jesus answered them, Truthfully, truthfully, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth and acteth and continueth in sin is a servant or the slave of sin. And the slave or servant abideth not in the house forever. In other words, they cannot stay in the house. They cannot be a son and daughter of God. He says, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore make you free, ye shall be free indeed. And we know that Jesus is the word of God. In the beginning was the word and the word with God and the word was God. Galatians 6, 7 through 8 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, he shall reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. He said that if you continue in my word, then you are planting a good seed in your heart and your mind and your life. But if you, if you plant something else in your heart and your mind and your life, it will bear fruit. He says, God's not mocked. God's not going to say, well, you planted uh, anger and bitterness, but you're going to reap love and kindness and joy. You reap, you know, you planted love and kindness and joy, but instead you're going to reap bitterness and hopelessness. No, if you, you plant a good seed and you continue to plant the right seed, then you'll produce fruit. Now, if you, and we will read this, if you plant a good seed and then you allow kinds of weeds and other things to grow in there, it'll grow up and choke it. Matthew 13, 37, 39, And he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Now this was a parable that Jesus taught, where he says that a good man planted a good seed, and then an enemy came and planted tares. Now in the context of what he's preaching about, he's preaching about people who are right with him and then people who appear to be right with God right beside him. And then he says, I'll judge him at the end time. Don't try rooting out the ones who appear to be right with me because I'll be the judge. But you can also say, say that God plants good seed in our life and we've got to watch what else is planted in us. Luke 8, 15 through 15, I mean 5 through 15 says, A sorrow went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside and was trodden down. And the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock. And as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns. And a thorn sprang up with it and choked it. And others fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? Now, in another book of the Bible, um, I'm not sure if it's John or Mark, he talks about, he says it in a slightly, I think it was actually Matthew, he says it in a different way. He says, right after he says the parable, it says, his disciples and those who followed him got, went to Jesus and asked him, what does this mean? And he says, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, because you have eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand. They don't. What was the difference? Because the disciples and the ones who followed Christ went to Christ afterwards and asked him. Or you could say it this way. They continued to seek him, asking him to know the truth, to know his word. So you could go back to that scripture verse that says, 
if you continue in my word, then I will reveal the truth to you, and that truth will make you free. So these disciples and the people fought him. They asked him, and Jesus answered. And he said unto you, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. This is a seed that goes into your heart, into your mind, into your life. Those by the wayside, there they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh the word out of their heart, lest they should believe and be saved. These are just people who, in passing, hear the word of God, but it doesn't take root in their heart at all. And the devil steals it before God can use it to bring it back to his remembrance. They are on the rock, are they, which when they hear the word, they receive the word with joy, and they have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. And actually, if you read in context, I would say that the people who were listening to Jesus when he said, if you continue in my word, they are the ones who take a whole, they with joy received it. But because something else came along that didn't agree with their doctrine or what they believed, they quickly fell away. They had no root in that word. And that's these people who were on the rock. And he says, and they which fell among thorns are they which when they hear the word go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. So they hear the word, but the cares and things of this world, other seeds choke it out. But that on the good ground are they which are an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it or continue in it. Continue to read it, continue to seek it, continue to listen to it, continue to mud meditate on it, continue to study it, and bring forth fruit with patience. Deuteronomy 30, 14. But the word of God is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. If you read that section of scripture verse right before it, it says, Who will go across the ocean to get us the word of God? Who will go up to heaven to get it for us? In other words, they were saying, we can't reach it. It's out of our reach. And Jesus, God says, no. It is very nigh you. All you got to do is speak it until you believe it. Continue in it until it becomes real to you. John 8, 31 to 32. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then will you know me. Then will you really fall on me. Then will you be my disciple indeed. And ye shall know who I am. You shall know what I'm saying. You shall know what my will is, and that truth shall make you free. The seed of the word moment. Romans 12, 1 through 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He says, brethren, I beg of you, I ask of you, by God's love, his goodness, his mercy, that you give your hearts and your minds all that you are as a sacrifice living for God in holiness and righteousness, submitted and yielded unto God, which is a more than reasonable service. And be not followers and conformed and become like this world, but be transformed by taking hold of the truth and washing and cleansing your mind with it, that you may do the perfect will of God. Second Corinthians 5.15 says, And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. He says, Jesus died for us, that we no longer live for our own sakes, for our own pleasure, but we live for him who died for us, and that is the mercy and the goodness of God. First Thessalonians 5.10, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Not only are we living for him, but we live, move, and have our being in him. We live with and through him. First Peter 2.24 says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins, set free from sin, should live unto the righteousness or the very nature and character of God, by whose stripes ye were healed. We always hear by the stripes of Jesus you are healed from your physical illness, and that is true. But even more so, you are healed from, disease, from sickness that comes from sin. 
that causes anger, that causes bitterness, that causes separation between your family because you don't even remember why you argued, that causes hatred and uh, lust and greed and causes you to cheat or somebody or you to be cheated. By God's mercy, we are to live a life for him with all of our heart and all of our mind and all of our strength. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27 says, Husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious, wonderful church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Going back to by his love and his mercy, we are supposed to be cleansed and washed by his word and present our life as a living, wonderful sacrifice, a bride without spot or wrinkle or any other thing. 2 Timothy 2, 15-21 says, Study the show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That is why it says, Be not conformed, but transformed by the renewing of your mind. Know the truth, and the truth will make you free. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Don't talk about foolish things. Don't lean to the power of your own understanding. I've seen people who get caught up in doctrines and their own thoughts, and what happens is they get led astray. Instead of continuing and meditating upon the word of God, instead of being conformed to his word, they're conformed to the world, to weird doctrines, or to their own emotions. And he says, For they will increase unto becoming more ungodly, and the world will eat as a canker, of whom is Hymenus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. These guys, they lean to their own understanding. They went with their own emotions. And all of a sudden, they not only erred from the truth, but they overthrew the faith of others. And he says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one of them that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house... They are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. And this scripture matches with our seed of word for this moment that says, be not conformed, but transformed. Become a vessel that God can use, that he can glorify his name, that you can be the light and sought for the world. Romans 8, 5 through 8 says, for they, are, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, or they are conformed to this world. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally or fleshly minded is death leading to death. But to be spiritually minded or Christ minded or his word minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind will always fight against God. For it is not submitted to the law or the word of the Lord, neither indeed can it be. Your mind, your emotions in the flesh and in your strength cannot be yielded to God. That's why it says meditate on the word night and day, because only by then can you bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Joshua 1, 8 through 9 says, This book of the law, or my word, shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein, or think upon, ponder upon, day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that's written there. You won't be able to do what's all written there if you don't know what's in there, and you won't be able to continue to do what's in there if you don't continue and saturate yourself in the word of God. And he says, for then, he says, thou may observe to do according to all that's written there. And for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have I not commanded thee? Be strong. And there's another verse that says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Be strong and of good courage, or have faith and trust in him. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed or lose hope. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Psalms 119, 9 through 11 says, Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way? by taking heed thereunto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. O oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word hath I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. I have conformed myself and washed myself and saturated myself in your word. Romans 12, 1 through 2. I beseech you, I beg you therefore, brethren, by God's love, his grace, his goodness, his mercy, 
that you give your heart, your mind, your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, completely unto him, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not made into the image or conformed to this world, but be ye made new, be a new creature, transformed by the renewing of that which you think, that ye may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. The seed of the word, Galatians six fourteen, But God forbid I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. He says, God forbid I should magnify and exalt and glory in and be proud of or excitement in, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, some people magnify the cross by itself, and that's not what he's saying here. Because he says right away, by whom or by Jesus Christ, the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 29 29-31 says that no flesh should glory in his presence. That's why he says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. None of us can glory and magnify in ourselves. None of us can have confidence in ourselves. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. God reveals to us his truth, his will. He reveals to us his nature and helps us to become like him, that we may walk and be sanctified and set apart, prepared for every good work, and be saved and redeemed from the curse of the law. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Philippians 3.3, 3, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So he's saying we are those who are Jews who have been circumcised in the flesh, which worship God in our heart and our mind and our spirit. We rejoice and glorify in Jesus Christ and we have no confidence in ourselves. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, For he had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He says, we have, we by Christ Jesus, who knew no sin, who gave his life for us, that we might be made righteous with God, that we might have the nature and character of Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Christ became the curse. Christ took our sickness, our illness, and our sin upon his back that we might be crucified to the world, that we might be set free and saved and delivered from this world. Matthew 26, 38 to 39. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry here and watch with me. And it went a little further, and he fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. He says, this, we finally see Christ. You know, it says, God forbid I should glory save in the cross, and by whom I am crucified unto the world. Now, what was Christ's sacrifice? What was the price that Christ paid? He says, Lord, not my will, but let your will be done. And then he goes, he says, Romans 6, 1, he says, Never, Lord, let your will be done be done. Romans 6, 1 through 11 says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He's saying, God has set us free. God has forgiven us. Should we continue in that which is wrong? God forbid. How shall we that are dead or crucified to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So he's saying, you've been crucified to the world and the world has been crucified unto you. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. He says, we are now a new creation in Christ. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve or be a slave of sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death has no more dominion over him. For in that he dieth, he dieth unto sin once, that we might be set free from sin. 
but that he liveth, he liveth unto God, that we may live, move, and have our being in him, and have his nature. He says, likewise reckon ye yourself also to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Galatians 6, 14, but God forbid I should glory, magnify, and exalt in anything else, but in the example of the cross of our Lord Jesus, by whom his love and his sacrifice and his obedience, I am now dead and crucified unto this world, and this world is crucified unto me. A seed of word moment. First Peter 1, 8 through 9. Whom having not seen, you love, and whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. He says, you haven't seen him, but you love him. You believe him, and because you believe him, you rejoice with joy unspeakable. Because of this love, that, this faith that works by love, that causes a joy in your heart, you receive the end of this confidence, of this faith, even the salvation of your soul. John 20, 29, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they who have not seen, and yet have believed. 1 John 4, 16 through 19, And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. So we love him because he showed his love to us. And because of this love and his faith, we will have confidence, we will trust in him, and we will be able to walk in faith and hope and grace to where we're not fearing what man will do to us, but we won't believe the devil's lie that we can't overcome, that God won't provide our needs, that God won't make a way. So we will be walking in love and faith and joy, receiving the end of the, taking Christ at who he is and what his word says, which will be the salvation of our soul. And that's not only in, most importantly, it's deliverance from sin. But it's also deliverance of our body from illness. It's also deliverance of a situation where God will provide all we need according to his riches and glory. And it's this deliverance where we have this great hope to where we won't lose hope because we know that we'll be together with him for all eternity. John 15, 10 through 11. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. He says, if you continue and you take a hold and you have faith in me, if you keep my word in your heart and your mind, then you will have that joy that 1 Peter 1, 8 through 9 was speaking of. But only if you take a hold of his promises, if you continue in his word. Nehemiah 8 through 10 I mean, 8.10 says, Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto the Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Once again, that joy that God gives us. He says it'll be in your heart and in your mind. He says, God gives you everything you need. And as you take what God's given you, his word, his promises, and you give what to what you have to others, whether that be you know, freely have received, freely give in the sense of God's grace and his peace and his joy that he's given you, or whether when he provides you financially or in the flat, you know, houses, clothes, whatever you need, as you see need, you give to others. And he says, the joy of the Lord will be your strength. First John 5, 1 through 5 says, whosoever believeth that Jesus is Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also is begotten of him. He says, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. We know that we love God when we keep his word in our heart and our mind. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his word and his commandments are not grievous to us. Now that doesn't mean that the word of God will not be grievous to the flesh, but we continue to take the word until our heart and mind come in line with the word and the flesh is crucified together with him. And he says, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. 
Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God, or he who believes that Christ has come, he's more than enough, and that he has showed his love, and we can love him in return. 1 Peter 1, 8 through 9, whom having not seen, this Christ who gave his heart, who gave his mind, who gave his life, you love him. And in loving him, though you don't see him, yet, having, yet believing him, you'll have joy unspeakable and full of glory. Receiving the end of this faith, of this trust, of this confidence in Christ, even the salvation of everything you are, of your soul. A seed of the word moment. Ephesians 5, 18 through 20. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with his spirit, speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making a melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, don't be drunk with anything else but Jesus Christ. Because it will lead to sin. It will lead to foolishness. It will lead to excess. But be filled with his spirit. Speaking to yourself the truth. In hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and crying out. And making a melody in your heart to the Lord. Having a thankful heart for all things. In the name of the Father. By the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 2, 15 through 15-17 says. Love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world. The love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So he's saying, if you love the world, you will be drunk with the world, and you can't be filled with the Spirit because you're being an enmity against God. And he says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. John 6, 63 says, It is a spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words I speak unto you, they are spirit in their life. So you could go back and says, Be not drunk with this world, wherein is foolishness and excess, but be filled with his word. Be filled with his heart. Be filled with his will, speaking to yourself the truth in Psalms and hymns, crying out and making a melody in your heart out of your love and your thankfulness and your gratefulness to God. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 says, In whom ye also trusted, talking about Jesus Christ, after that ye heard the word, once again, the word of God, which is his, you know, it, which is his spirit, of truth, the gospel, or the good news of being saved, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until we are redeemed, because we are purchased by his blood unto the praise of his glory. So if you could say, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with that spirit of holiness to where we want to please God, where we want to be like God. That spirit of promise where it is, Jesus says, my words are spirit in our life. So we can be filled with his word, where we can be filled with the promises of God that says he will never leave us nor forsake us. That he, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. That trust him with all of our heart. He will provide all of our needs. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Where we can be filled with that spirit. Not a spirit of fear. Not a spirit of doubt. Not a spirit of anger. Not a spirit of bitterness. Not a spirit of lust and covetousness. Not a spirit of drunkenness. Because it talks about that. And he says, but we will be filled with that Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. And Somehow I accidentally repeated that. So don't be filled with the world, but be filled with the word and the nature and who Christ is, and you will be able to have his nature and character. Fair Thessalonians 5.18, And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. If you want to know the will of God, it says, And everything give thanks. That's a very simple, easy thing to say. Because if you're giving thanks unto God, then you're not murmuring and complaining. If you're giving thanks unto God, then you're not, it's very hard to be worried and anxious if you're thanking God. Because you're remembering what God's done, you're remembering what his word says, and that will deliver you from what the enemy's trying to do. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Be careful or worried or anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. In other words, take everything to the Lord in prayer. Whether it be, Lord, I come boldly before you, I repent for what I've done, 
Lord, I ask for your help, or Lord, I need this, or Lord, I'm thanking you and praising you for this. And he says, and the God of peace, which passes everything we could think about, passes this carnal mind, this carnal understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You won't be... You won't be fearful. You won't lose hope. Your mind won't be going all over the place, but you will be kept through Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5, 18 through 20. And be not filled or drunk with wine or this world, wherein is sin and excess, but be filled with the spirit of God, of holiness, of promise, of his word, speaking to yourself in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing it and praising and worshiping and making a melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. A seed of the word. Psalms 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And a lot of people know this, this scripture verse, but they'll actually use it. Delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the car you want, the house you want, and all these things. And no, that's not what it's talking about. Because our heart is naturally wicked, and God wants to cleanse our heart of that which is wrong. Matthew 6, 19 through 34 says, Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth, where moth and rust does corrupt, and where thieves break through nor steal. He says, don't delight yourself in the things of this world. Don't seek the things of this world. Don't lay up the things of this world. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust does corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You could say, for what you delight in, your heart will be there. If you delight in football as a guy, your heart and your mind will be there, even to the extent of possibly skipping Sunday night service. If your heart and your mind is, on, as a lady, as an example, if your heart and mind is maybe in a sale or in clothes or something, instead of maybe spent, uh, spending time in prayer or word or maybe going and telling somebody about Christ, You'll be so worried about that sale that you're going to miss that you'll ignore that person in need. And that's just an example for both sides because all of us have things that we would want to delight in more than Christ in the flesh. He says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. If you delight and treasure in Christ, your eye will be single. You'll be full of Christ. You'll be filled with his light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? If you think you have the light of Christ, but then yet you're walking in sin, or yet you're living in for something else, then that light that you think is, is wonderful is actually a darkness, because a great darkness, because you're walking in self-deceit. You think you love Christ, but by your actions, you're proving you love something else more. And because you believe you're fine, because you believe you're right, you're, world, you're actually walking in a darkness greater than those in the world. Because that's why Jesus said to the church in Revelation, he says, I would rather you hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. And he says, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot delight in God and the world because you will end up serving one of them or you will end up being pulled apart and you will be un mentally unstable. And we probably have all experienced at one time where the flesh is crying out for something, but the Spirit of God is crying out for something. And as long as we try to stay the middle ground, we feel like we're being pulled in two and split apart. Or... We're, off, we're, we're actually delighting in God and we get victory over the flesh or we get delighting in the flesh and God is being left behind. Even to the point to where our mind and our flesh will be screaming out, I don't care what God wants, I will do what I want. And that's why it says you cannot serve two masters. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than me and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Your, your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which you by taking thought can add one cubit, or even one little inch, unto his height? And why take ye thought for your clothes? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all of his glory, with all of his wealth, being the wealthiest man who's ever lived, was not even arrayed as beautiful as nature that God has created. 
And he says, this, If God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you and take care of you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What we shall eat. Don't even worry about it. Don't even ponder upon it, what we shall eat or what we shall drink, or wherewith shall we have or what we shall wear. For after all these things to the Gentiles, or those who don't know God, seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his nature and his character, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient today is it evil thereof. So delight yourself in the Lord, and he will take care of what you need, and he will give you the desires of your heart. But what is a desire of our heart? He says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. He says, now you are clean to the word which I have spoken unto you. So he wants to cleanse you and wash you to where your heart is pure, to where you have desires that says, I want to help that person in need instead of I want to be greedy, to where I am willing to forgive that person instead of being bitter. Luke 12, 32 says, Fear not, little flock, for his father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And what is the kingdom? That God says, Seek ye first my kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's not the things of this world. It's not our flesh. It's not our emotions. It's not our carnal reasoning, but righteousness or having the nature and character of Jesus Christ, peace, being surrendered and having faith and trusting in him, joy, a thankful and a grateful heart in the Holy Ghost. Hebrews eleven six says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. What are we delighting in? What are we seeking? To be right with God, to love God, to love others, to be the light and salt of the world that others might be delivered and saved and set free, that they will not no longer walk in darkness, that our family, our friends, our neighbors will be saved and healed and delivered. Matthew 7, 7 through 8 says, Ask and ye shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. In him that knocketh it shall be opened him. Him who delights in me, I will give him the desires of his heart. Psalms 37, 4. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. A seed of the word. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, you'll hear the scripture verse used for salvation, and it is for salvation, but it's more than that. Because he says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But if you're not, if you're not in Christ, what are you in? There's only one option. There's the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. If you're not in light, you're in darkness. Galatians 6, 15 through 16 says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision. Jews or Gentiles, neither one is the answer, but being a new creature in Christ. And as many as walk according to this rule of a living and abiding in Christ, of being in Christ, of being like him, peace be unto them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God, or those who are the sons and daughters of Christ. Romans 8, 1 through 4 says, There is therefore now no condemnation, they're not condemned. They're not damned. To those who which are in Christ Jesus, once again, in Jesus Christ, who walk not after the flesh, and this is going to show us what he meant by being in Christ, who walk not after their flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, or the law that says my heart, my mind, my emotions, everything I am belongs to Christ. I live, move, and have my being in him has set me free from the law that is caused by sinning and dying from it. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. If you sow to the flesh, you'll flesh reap corruption. But if you sow to the Spirit, you shall reap life everlasting. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through our own sinful flesh, that what's what it wants, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, in a, in a, in a physical body, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh and overcame it, trying over it, all, over it, all of it, that the righteousness of the law, or what God set in his law that was his nature and character written in the Old Testament, may now be fulfilled in us 
who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Or you could say it this way, who no longer walk what we want as the world is, as we're led by our emotions or by the flesh or by what people say, but we walk after Jesus Christ and we live and move in him. Colossians 3, 1 through 4, if you then be risen or Christ, or you could say it this way, if you then be live and living in Christ, be in Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your love, your affection, your desires, your treasures on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are now dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, or you could say it, when Christ, who we are in, shall appear, then shall you appear with him in glory. John 15, 3 through 5 says, Now you are clean to the word which I have spoken unto you. He says, I have cleansed you and washed you by the word. He says, Abide in me, or be in me, live in me, dwell in me, continue in me, remain in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it live in the vine, no more can you except you live and remain in me. I am the vine, or the answer. I am the life. I am the righteousness. I am the peace and the joy. Ye are the branches. He that liveth and remaineth in me, and I live in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Or you could say, if any man is in Christ, he will produce love, peace, joy, kindness, gentleness, the nature and character of Christ. He'll be a new creature. But if you're not, then you can only produce what you are. And it goes on in John, and it talks about if a man abide not in me, he's shriveled up as a branch, is, is cast aside and burns in unholy fires. Acts 17, 28 says, For in him we live, move, and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring or his children. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Jesus Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. A seed of the word moment. 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. He says, God has not given us a spirit of torment or tor or, or losing hope, but of power in God love in God, and of a sound mind. Romans 8.32 says, he, is, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with, us, with him also freely give us all things? So we don't have to believe the devil's lie that says we can't overcome, or God doesn't love us, because God says, I proved my love upon the cross, and I've given you all things. I will give you everything you need. 2 Peter 1, 3 through 4 says, According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to the life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who has called us glory and virtue. He has given us everything we need for life and being like him through his word and through his knowledge, whereby are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises, many more than we need. Exceeding means more than you need. Great and incredible promises and precious promises that we can hold on to, that by these promises, by this divine power, by what Christ has done and by his word, ye might be a partaker of the divine nature. You might be like Christ, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. What is the opposite of fear? He says, I have not given you a spirit of fear. I believe it's faith. It's Matthew eight twenty six, and he saith unto them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. He says, why are you fearful? You should have more faith. He said, in other words, the opposite of fear is faith. Faith in what? Christ and in his word. So you could read that first part of this. God has not given us fear, but faith. The second part, but a power, the divine power of God. Ephesians 1, 19 through 20 says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us were to believe? What is this over that we need, this awesomeness, this incredibleness power to us were to have faith? If we have faith, then we have the power of God. According to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him in his own right hand in the heavenly places. This says to open our eyes to see the exceeding greatness of his power to, to us who have faith in Christ, 
to see this power that overcame sin in Christ Jesus, who died for our salvation and then was resurrected in the newness of life. Romans 8.11 says, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. You could take power and make it grace. For by grace are you saved. By God's power working in your heart and your mind and your emotions and your circumstances, you are saved. And he says the same power, the same spirit now dwells in us. That same spirit that quickened Christ Jesus now dwells in us. Acts 4.33, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. So with this power that God gives to us, this not part of fear, but by faith, comes into our life to overcome sin, overcome the world, and to lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So we can say that God has given us the extreme power, His Holy Spirit and His grace, or His overpowering Spirit enabling us to do His will. Love. It's God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love. Romans 5 eight says, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So He has given us His love upon the cross. John, 1 John 4, 9 through 11. And this was revealed, the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. The love of God says, I love you. I set you free from sin, that you may now overcome, that you may now overcome this world. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. This is the real love that God showed to us. And he says, he sent his son to be the perpetuation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. So the power by faith in God, his grace in God by believing him, has now given us a love to love him and to love others. Psalms 119.97 says, Oh, how love I thy law is my meditation all the day. So not only is this love that God's given us from him to love him in return, but it's to love the truth. Because if you love the truth, you won't love a lie. Romans 8.32 says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall we not with him also freely give us all things? He's given us all things that pertain in life and godliness, and that includes his word. So the love that God's given us is proved by his word, because he did not leave us to walk in darkness or be blind. And what else also comes of love? A thankful heart. If you truly love your parents, you're thankful. If you truly love God, you'll be have a thankful heart. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And in the last, it says, A sound mind. Isaiah 26.3 says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on him, because he trusteth in me. A sound mind is a mind stayed upon Christ. And then is also a mind that loves his word, because great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Romans 12, 1 through 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by loving his word, by washing your mind with his word, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's why it says, if you take the context of that scripture, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind, it's actually talking about doing the will of God. It's saying, don't be fearful that you can't overcome, that you can't do the will of God. But remember that he's given us his grace, he's proven his love, and he's given us his truth that we might have a sound mind. Matthew 4.4 4 says, well, one before that, Philippians 2, 5 through 8, let this mind be in you, or let this sound mind be in you that was in Christ, which was also, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him a form of servant, and was made in likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So a sound mind is the mind of Christ, that humbles ourselves and becomes obedient unto the will of the Father, even unto the death of the cross. And also the sound mind of Christ was proven in Matthew 4.4. 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So a sound mind, a 
is one that takes Christ's word and lives by it. So 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of tear, fear or torment or hopelessness, but of power, grace, of Christ being in us, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world, but of power, of faith, of trust and confidence in him, of love, of remembering of who he is and what he's done, and of a sound mind. And then I'm going to end with this scripture verse. 1 Peter 1.23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Being born again, not of something that is wishy-washy, that goes to the left or the right, but this is true, and it remains true. By his word, or by Jesus Christ, which is the word of God, made in the flesh, which liveth and abideth forever. Here we go ahead and end in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word. We ask you to help us to plant your seed in our heart and our mind. Continue in it. Continue to water it. Continue to plant more seed. And help us to not allow other things to be planted in our garden that we may produce your nature and your character. In Jesus' name, amen.